people come to me and say, Z, you keep saying the controllers, and they, and the powers that shouldn't be, and this old world order that everybody thinks is a new world order, but it's just an old world order. And Who are they, Z? Tell me who they are. Okay. Well, Z's going to do his best. Because people say, oh, Z, it's, it's the Jesuits. A lot of people say, no, Z, it's the small hatties, of course, dum-dum. And I say, well, who knows? Maybe it's neither. Maybe it's both. Thus this term, the unholy alliance. In our distant past, we have beings that are known by every culture, whether you call them the Anunnaki, the Elohim, the Greek gods, the Tuatha Du Danon. Everybody remembers some superior being that lived for a long time. To us, they were immortal, much more advanced than us, and teachers of mankind in every culture from Mesopotamia to South America and everywhere in between. Now, I don't know. They may look like this or they may look like this. But for some reason or another, they left. And I think that they appointed righteous kings over all of the nations before they left. So I like the way he laid it down there. He basically said, look, there seems to be some type of, call them demigods, some type of entities that seem to be knowledgeable and powerful that in some way were interacting with humanity at some point. Now, the timeline we can argue about. All right, we can argue about the timeline. Some people think the timeline is much, much shorter than it's presented. Some people think it's much longer. Either way, what this man is positing is there seems to be these entities that have interacted with us. Were they some weird reptilian-like goofy lizard beings? Were they more like etherical and Pleiadian, which would be more of a, not a Nordic, but almost like an Anglo-Saxon uh, type of depiction of the gods. Either way, there appears to be a ubiquitous story that runs through humanity, a story that runs through various cultures, one in which the gods were here and bestowed the kingship to men. Now, I conjecture that it's a bloodline lineage. When I look at the ruling elites of the last at least a few thousand years, the so-called blue bloods, we find a lot of commonalities in their genetic lineage. This is where you get the legends of the royal bloodlines. And no matter how rich you get, how many titles you bestow on yourself, nobility can never become true royalty. And that really bothers some people. After the gods left, you had these priests that used to be the servants of the gods. They understood some of the things that the gods had done, like metallurgy and agriculture, and probably some things on the spiritual side, and started the mystery schools with their knowledge. This made them a really rich, powerful class of people. And it said that knowledge is power. Well, imagine if you had the knowledge of the gods. Would you share it? Does everybody look like they're able to handle this knowledge? And you look around at humanity. You think your neighbors could handle this? I don't know. Maybe they could, but either way, the story being presented here is one of this priestly class in antiquity being bestowed knowledge along with these apparent bloodline ruling elites. And then furthermore, this knowledge being occulted through their mystery schools and secret societies. Now let's talk about the Earth catastrophe cycle and jump through a few ages of man. We're skipping a couple, but you got the ancient Mycenaean culture, and then the Bronze Age collapse, and then the Greek Dark Age. Then you have the rise of the Greeks and the Romans, and then they collapse in the Earth shift cycle in 536 AD. Uh, official dating, I'm not getting into the dating right now, but this was earthquakes, volcanoes, flooding, famine, and decimation of society. And then we go into the Dark Ages for 800 years, apparently. And then pop out the other side with a renaissance of all things Roman. And this happens after what we're told is the Black D. All right. So this guy just went warp speed through about 2,000 years of history. I like his presentation regarding the shifts in civilization because he associates them with Earth shifts, cataclysm, catastrophe. Like he's saying here with the Black Death or the bubonic plague that occurred in Europe in the mid-1300s, apparently. Now, we could argue about the added 1,000 years. I do think there's a strong argument to be made that the Dark Ages may have been filled in, made up. 
but that's another topic. But either way, we could paint history, at least uh, known history, let's call it post-Diluvian or post-flood history, with the Sumerians and the Egyptians. Then you see the rise of the Phoenician culture, then the Greeks, the Romans, and then you have the fall of Rome somewhere around four or 500 AD, 800 years of dark ages, and then the Renaissance period, which was after the supposed Black Death. Some reports say that we're talking two-thirds of the population gone. And this wasn't just some bug. It was the Earth shift cycle. Here, I can show you. You can read through some of the specific things that happened during this period. If you've never heard this stuff before, you should pause and read it. It's pretty interesting. But I'm going to get on up here to this. Naples, Rome, Pizza, Bologna, uh, Padua, Venice, all of northern Italy and pretty much Europe got wiped out. This is covered up, and they just use the Black D as an excuse for what happened when most of Europe got wiped out and cities today are still half buried. Now back to the priest class. I know some people won't like this, but I think Jesus came along as an absolute savage and told the people that these hypocrite Pharisees had people bowing down to beans that were long gone. He knocked over their money tables. He started whipping them, and the Pharisees hated him, but the people loved him. News of him spread quickly throughout the Mediterranean world, and this threatened the priests of all the temples. So they decided we better get on board or get left behind and converted all of their temples to churches. And they He's presenting a different story of the Christ figure relative to the common presentation. The common Bible, the one we all accept, what should I say, the one that most people accept, has Christ linked to the... Old Testament figure of Yahweh. This man's presenting a different understanding, and uh, it's an understanding that many share. As he said, if you read the scriptures of the New Testament, there's an understanding that the Christ figure was in no way associated with the practices of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the ruling religious elite of the time. He actually seemed to be rebelling against that system and that structure. Because this is going to come into play when we talk about the unholy alliance. Because this man is positing, and I would tend to agree with him, that the link that we see between the Christ figure and the deity associated as God in the Old Testament may indeed be the unholy alliance. And that contrary to espousing that he was the son of the Jewish Israelite God, that indeed the Christ figure may have been speaking out against that God. And they started consolidating power into the Church of Rome. Behind the scenes, they're still following the old religion. Right, you see this picture here. Here's the Pope, the Pontiff. Notice what he's wearing, the fish hat. I believe it's also called a mitre. He's comparing that to a dragon priest of Babylon, possibly even Samaria. Again, you can see the depiction of the fish and the hat. You know, so the Catholic Pope's wearing the same style hat as the old pagan priest. A lot of the early Sumerian depictions of these godlike creatures were dragon-like. You see the depiction of the dragon across many, many, many cultures throughout history. Why is the Catholic priest, or the Catholic Pope, wearing imagery associated with these pagan dragon gods? By the time of the reset 700 years ago, it became powerful enough to declare war on every other religious sect. They cleansed northern Italy and southern France of the Cathars, the Gnostics, the Bogomils, and annihilated every other religion outside of theirs except for one. This one religion outside of Christianity, they permitted to commit usury against the Christians. And this began the modern unholy alliance. What they're saying is the... Roman Catholic Church in let's call it the late Dark Ages, early Renaissance period, basically formed this so-called unholy alliance with, you guessed it, the people here that have this symbol, some call it the uh, Star of Rimfram. It's also the symbol that you see on the flag of Israel. Some say they're Khazarian. Some say they're Babylonian. Either way, there appears to be a historical context around 
a alliance with the Roman Catholic Church and our small hattie friends. Or just the alliance. And I suspect this is why we're told that the benevolent God that Jesus was talking about was the same as the vengeful, wrathful, jealous God of the Old Testament. Even though Jesus called those priests a den of vipers. Now, I know some people don't like religion. Heck, I don't like religion. But these guys are unimaginably wealthy and responsible for all the conflicts of our modern era. But the priest class couldn't be happy with all of their wealth and opulence. So they argued that their authority was greater than the king's. But for a long time, the king was strong enough to keep the usurpers at bay. After the 14th century catastrophes, the church grew to be the Holy Roman Empire. Families like the Medicis and the Habsburgs allied with the Venetian black nobility who controlled trade throughout the Mediterranean. And the conquest was going pretty good for them until the 1500s and the Protestant Reformation, which is the most underrated name ever because this began another period where the Pope had to cleanse the land of the heretics. Millions were inquisitioned for not submitting to papal authority. But Protestants and old world humanists managed to break away and started the Age of Enlightenment, which is the foundation of all our modern Western nations. But the priests couldn't have an age of reason, so they started a militant order of MK Ultra foot soldiers known as the Society of Jesus or the J-Suits. So here we're introduced to our friends, the so-called Jesuits, formed under one Ignatius of Loyola. Notice their symbol with the cross and the sun. And if you have never read their oath, you should. This is the Jesuit oath. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to leave it up here for anybody who wants to read it. So if you are a Jesuit priest, you apparently are bound by the dictates of this oath, which are quite dastardly. It appears that our friends, the Jesuits, were formed by the Holy Roman Empire right around this time, 13, 1400s, 1500s maybe to basically become a militant arm of the Catholic Church. Not only that, it appears that they were in charge of shaping education and academia up until this day. Look no further than the prevalence of the Jesuit-run institutions of higher learning all around the world. Why were the Jesuits, this priestly class, so involved with education? Why, when you look at the presentation of science that we're given, at least over the last 500 years, why is it underpinned by so many of these Jesuit priests? Both you should probably pause and read this. For 500 years, their objective has been to infiltrate and subvert any kingdom or nation that is broken free from the Pope's grip. Societies like the Square and Compass guys started out as genuine enlightenment thinkers and was subverted by the J suits to where nobody realizes that the top of the pyramid is the black popa, the ones they think that they're against. Illuminated ones started by Adam Vi All right, So notice he said the black pope. This goes down to a theory that the true pope who's, let's say, running the scene is not the pope that's presented from the Vatican, but the black pope who's apparently is seated in the island nation of Malta which can be found in the Mediterranean Sea. Weishaupt, who was a former J-Suit professor, which is like saying ex-CIA, there's no such thing. You're in or you're deceased. Even Hollywood is just a continuation of them influencing public opinion through drama. So on the face of things, you have the Holy Fathers on the moral high ground, while in the background, you have the superior general managing all of the controlled opposition which is meant to subvert society through moral decay. 1835, Samuel Morse, inventor of Morse code, warned of their plot to overthrow the U.S. by, guess what? Catholic relocation. Sound familiar? Then he brings it up to present day, basically saying that for hundreds of years, there was a plan to overthrow the United States of America through foreign immigration. A lot of us like to hold on, again, to our beliefs, our conditioning. We want to hold on to this United States of America as some beacon of freedom, the uh, shining light on the hill of liberty. Well, that's one story. What if there's another story? What if they created this nation as uh, basically a front, 
you present a story of liberty, you present a story of freedom, you present a story of individualistic rights, and then in the ultimate irony, you use that country to enslave the entire world under the banner of tyranny. As he mentioned, Adam Weisskopf earlier, Jesuit, the supposed founder of the Bavarian Illuminati, which to me, not so coincidentally, was formed the very same year as the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, with the same founders, Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Franklin, and others. Why were the same founding members of the United States also associated with the founding of this Jesuit-run occult group 